everyone. Uh, I got a new camera and I was going to test it out at a concert but then we went into lockdown so I'm just going to tell you about uh, how I ended up at CERN and a little bit about what that was like for 18 minutes and 6 seconds on average. Um, so basically I've always been interested in particle physics. I remember when I was about 6 or so I asked my dad uh, what molecules were made of and he said atoms and I asked what atoms were made of and he said well they think they're made of things called quarks but they're not really sure he, he didn't even mention as far as I remember neutrons protons and electrons he just went straight to quarks but when you're six and an adult doesn't know something that's really fascinating so um, since then I was really interested and when I got on the internet, uh, when I was 15, four, yeah, um, I started reading things about particle physics on there. Um, so, you might have seen in the, the video about when I went to a concert with Woz and all that, uh, I went to the Apple Worldwide Developers Conference in 2004, but, um, when you're from New Zealand, you can't just go to San Francisco for a week. It's really far away. Everywhere of interest is really far away um, because nobody wants to go to Australia. And uh, so I wanted to plan a bit of a longer trip. Um, pe people do a thing called the big OE or overseas experience where they just travel for a couple of months, maybe pick up some kind of job somewhere. I don't really know how that works, but, um, so I, I was going to do something like that, and I found out from my friend Jack that you could get some kind of ticket, a round the world ticket, where uh, you could visit five places um, in the world, and so I thought, well, my five places, I'll go to WWDC, I'll visit my friend Rob in Canada, um, I'll visit my friend Tony in Ireland, and then I'll visit my friend Grace in Germany, uh, and then I can visit Jack in the Netherlands. Um, but then Jack moved back to but moved to New Zealand. Uh, I think it was the second time he'd moved there, uh, so I needed to find a new fifth place, and. Um, this, by the way, this was in 2003. I was planning this a long time in advance. And at the time, I was reading this book, Quarks, Leptons, and the Big Bang by Jonathan Alday. And this book was the first book that really made me feel like I understood particle physics somewhat, which uh, probably, if you think you understand particle physics, you don't. So maybe it's a terrible book. But I really like this book. Um, it has some hilarious footnotes in it as well um, and it talked about CERN a bit so I thought well maybe for my fifth place I wonder if it's possible to visit CERN um, so I looked at the CERN website not only could you organize a guided tour to actually visit the experiments uh, you, they also had a summer student program and some fellowship programs so um, I looked into the summer student program because that obviously seemed like the easiest thing to get into. Um, and it uh, turns out that's only for undergraduates and I'd already graduated so I wasn't eligible for that. Um, but they had some fellowships and I applied for, I think it was a junior fellowship. Uh, and my plan, my, I figured this was a huge long shot, um, but my plan was I would just keep applying every year until either I reached the age limit or they got so sick of me applying that they let me in. Um, and also I started to download some of the summer student lectures because they're all online, um, all streamed and everything. Um, but this was 2003, so... We didn't really have really fast internet at the time. So I, I saw something on the website about DVDs of the lectures, and um, I 
I emailed them through the contact us form asking if it would be possible to get DVDs. Um, and I didn't realize it at the time. I got this, this email back just from somebody saying, I'll forward this to the relevant person. And what I didn't realize was the person who sent that email was actually Robert Cayo, um, one of the co-inventors of the World Wide Web. Um, I did not think I knew who he was at the time, but I did actually meet him quite a while later when I was at CERN. Uh, there was a 20th anniversary of the web event, and I got my picture taken with him and the uh, world's first web server. So that was kind of cool. Um, and uh, anyway, it didn't really seem like it would be easy to get the DVDs. I corresponded with some people about that, but it didn't really work out. Um, and I, I mentioned actually in the, that contact form that I had tried looking in the DVD section of Amazon just for fun. Um, and uh, when I typed in CERN, it auto-corrected it to corn. When I typed in quark, it auto-corrected it to shark. And when I typed in lepton, it uh, corrected it to lipton, like the T. So uh, that was fun. Anyway, um, I, I sent an application for the fellowship on 4th of February 2004. Um, I, I had to get three reference letters. I'd only had one job at that time, so I, I think I got a reference letter from my someone I worked with and someone I... Uh, one of my lecturers from university, and I don't remember who the third one was. Um, on the 23rd of April, I found out that they'd copied my application over to a Marie Curie Early Stage Training Fellowship because they thought that my profile suited that fellowship. Um, so that's a fellowship that a lot of different institutes in, in Europe um, offer fellowships through. It's uh, funded by the European Commission and the idea is to get researchers uh, moving around in Europe or to Europe, um, you have to actually move to another country in order to do this kind of fellowship. I actually later met somebody who didn't move because uh, he already lived in France near the border where CERN was and then he was officially working at CERN in Switzerland even though CERN is in both countries and he actually was able to do a Marie Curie fellowship without even moving countries. I'm not sure whether that was allowed under the rules or not. Um, but anyway, uh, so my application was, was copied over to that. Um, and on the 1st of June, I found out that I didn't get the original fellowship that I applied for. Um, by that time, of course, I'd planned out all of my my travel and everything. Um, by the way, I never ended up getting the the round the world trip ticket. I never found out how to actually get that. I just booked normal flights in the end, but I'm still glad that I looked for a fifth place to go to. So, um, on the 25th of June, I flew to San Francisco for the Worldwide Developers Conference, and then uh, you can see my other video about meeting was if you want to know what happened immediately after that. Um, then um, in August I booked I booked my uh, my guided tour for CERN um, for the 29th of September. I, I booked I had basically a three month uh, trip planned and I told um, I told my work that I wasn't a hundred percent sure that I'd be coming back because the uh, the Marie Curie Fellowship I applied for was to start on first of September. So if I got that, maybe I would just stay there. Of course, I didn't really think there was much chance of that, and I would have to go back anyway to pick up some stuff. But um, anyway, um, I I went to to Dublin. I went to visit my friend uh, Grace in Regensburg and um, I did a Kentucky tour of Europe. Eventually, uh, 25th of September, I flew to Geneva um, and 
I still hadn't heard anything about this fellowship that had uh, that was supposed to start in September. Um, I actually emailed them on the the nineteenth of August, asking what was going on with that, and they said that um, they had already filled those um, those roles, but there was going to be more uh, Marie Curie fellowships coming up, and I could apply for those. Um, but I I didn't officially have an email saying that I was rejected from the fellowship, but I, I kind of figured that uh, obviously it was supposed to start in September, that, um, that I wasn't going to do it. Anyway, um, 27th of September uh, was uh, Monday. I, I actually went to CERN. I visited their microcosm exhibition, which is open all the time to visitors. Uh, I mean, on weekdays anyway. And um, uh, then when you go out of microcosm, there's a, a garden outside that has some old detectors in it. Um, and I went out to have a look at those. And I actually was locked out for a while. I didn't realize, uh, I guess you're not supposed to actually go into that garden if you're just a visitor in microcosm because I couldn't get back in. Um, I had to wait till a cleaner came by and opened the door, but at least I got to see these uh, old detectors, um, which was pretty cool. And I didn't realize at that time that I, I could have gone into any building at CERN, pretty much. Uh, I mean, there are some places where you need, there's some more access control, but uh, for just the general office buildings, once you're inside CERN, uh, you can go where you want. Um, please don't sneak into CERN. <laughs> Uh, it's it's pretty easy actually to to just ask somebody to show you around anyway. Um, so um, I had found out that um, I think after I'd already booked my flights, I found out that there was going to be a CERN open day on October seventeenth that year. But I was already flying back on the fifth of October. And so I was going to miss the open day, uh, the open day for the 50th anniversary of CERN, which is what this t-shirt, um, which I bought on that trip, of course, is commemorating. But I was going to be there um, on the 29th of September, when, which was the actual 50th anniversary celebration they were going to have in Crozet um, in France. And uh, they were apparently going to light up 24 powerful sky tracer floodlights to to illuminate the the LHC ring um, because the LHC is a uh, well it, I guess it wasn't running back then but it's a, a 27 kilometer ring and circumference is actually 26.6 or something um, so they were going to have uh, spotlights around the ring and you could go up this mountain in Crozet and, and see them from up there. Um, so I tried to find out um, how I would be able to get to Crozet for this thing because there wasn't really public transport going there and I couldn't find anything out. I think most of the Tuesday I was just trying to figure out how to get there but then on Wednesday the 29th of September um, that was the day they were doing this, but it was also the day that I that I booked my tour. So I went there, I did the tour, um, I got to see the Atlas experiment being made above ground, um, and then I asked at the reception if there was any way I could get to Crozet for the, the birthday celebration, um, and they didn't really know, but I... I talked to another guy that was sitting there named Richard who uh, worked for some company that supplied uh, something to CERN, I forget what it was, um, and he was also trying to figure out how to get there and uh, trying to order some taxis and we tried Swiss taxi companies and French taxi companies, none of them could help, and eventually Richard called a colleague of his and uh, we managed to get to the 50th anniversary celebration. Um, so that 
that's cool. There were a lot of speeches, almost all in French, and I didn't know any French at that time. Um, there was some very nice cake. Uh, there was one talk by Tim Berners-Lee just over a video link over the web, I guess. Um, that's the other uh, co-creator of the World Wide Web, in case you don't know. Um, so that one I understood, but mostly I was just standing around talking to Richard because he was the only one speaking English. And he told me that um, he had picked up that they were calling the people who work at CERN Cernois, um, which is the French version of basically Cernese or Cernish. Um, but that was just the standard word they were using to, to refer to people who worked at CERN. Um, and they lit up these uh, spotlights. I think I could see about five spotlights and it was very underwhelming. I mean, I know as a mathematician you only need four spotlights to to uniquely identify an ellipse, but it was a little bit too minimalist. I thought that there was some kind of uh, malfunction, but I heard from somebody later that actually it was only supposed to be those five spotlights. So, I don't know, it, it was a little disappointing, but anyway, the, the cake was great. Um, if I'm reaching forward, it's because I have some notes on my iPad to make sure I don't forget all of any of this. Um, I also talked to Paola Catapano, uh, who was emceeing the event, and um, she gave me the details of, of someone I could contact to talk about alternative ways of getting into CERN. So um, then the next day, in the morning, I got the official email saying that I didn't get the Marie Curie Fellowship. Um, but I, I emailed the person that Paula told me about and arranged to meet one of their colleagues the next day um, to talk about alternative ways of getting into CERN and visit the, um, the CERN Computing Center. Um, that was pretty cool. Uh, like we had coffee at the, the CERN cafeteria, which is not open for, for guests. Actually, now I think they are going to have, or they do already have a thing that's open to visitors. They've got this whole new um, public display that, that they're building at the moment that will go over the road and there will be an auditorium that's open to the public. There's a whole lot of stuff now that they didn't have then. Um, when I was first visiting CERN, I had to go across the road to a service station to buy a sandwich. Uh, but anyway, this time I went inside, I got to eat at the cafeteria, and we visited the computing center. Um, and he told me about uh, the grid and how to get involved with maybe some university or something that was working with, with CERN. Um, and then I think the next... Uh, the next day, I I was just I just stayed mostly in my hostel and and did some puzzles. I didn't really feel like doing a lot of tourism, and um, it's just as well I ended up going back there. Um, spoiler, <laughs> but you know I worked at CERN eventually, so um, I went home. Uh, I left Geneva on October third. I I had. Uh, DVDs from, from WWDC in the mail, um, and on the 24th of November I tried to apply for a new Marie Curie Early Stage Training Fellowship, and it wouldn't let me. It said, uh, it said you've already applied. And so I emailed them asking, am I, am I allowed to apply for this? It had the same identifier as the previous fellowship that I'd applied for. Um, but they said I could, actually, I should be able to still apply. Um, it's just that in their, their database, I guess they chose the wrong primary key or something like that. Um, so I couldn't apply, um, but uh, they were able to copy my application over for the next, uh, the next round of early stage training um, Marie Curie fellowships. And at this point, this was an application I'd done for a different kind of fellowship more than a year earlier, or no, it was less than a year, but still. Um, 
there were things I would have liked to have updated or made a bit more relevant to the specific fellowship, but okay, I couldn't edit it. Um, they just put it in as it was. Um, so then in January 2005, end of January, I went to Sydney um, for, finally went to Australia after going around the world, because that, that's, I mean, it's it's low priority um, place to go for a New Zealander. They had, uh, Apple was, was doing Tiger Tech Talks. Uh, Tiger was Mac OS 10.4, which was about to come out or had just come out, I don't remember. Um, so I, I, went, I stayed with my friend Chris, who was somebody I met at WWDC. Um, by the way, Chris introduced me to Tom Lehrer's music, uh, which indirectly is how I found out about Jonathan Colton and how I ended up going on all the Joko cruises and putting up all of the thousands of videos on this channel of Jonathan Colton in concert. So you can thank Chris for that. Um, on the 1st of February, I was coming home from the Tiger Tech Talks and Chris mentioned that Apple had come out with a new PowerBook G4, which I was very happy about because, uh, as I think I mentioned in the other video, I got a, um, a developer hardware discount uh, with my WWDC ticket, which expired in a year, so I was hoping that they would bring out something new that I could buy with that discount. Um, and then we got back to Chris's house, and I checked my email, and I found out that I got accepted for the Marie Curie Fellowship. Um, so that was quite an eventful day. Um, and they wanted me to start in March already, 1st of March, uh, but that was uh, negotiable. So then the next day, I heard from my friend Kala, who had been planning to get married but hadn't told us exactly when and she told me uh, the date of her wedding which was in March and um, so I, I replied back to Saren and asked if I could start on the 1st of April instead uh, so I could be there for the wedding and they said that was fine. Um, they never figured out that it was all an April Fool's joke and um, so I got home from there, um, I think, then I, f then I got a, a letter saying I'd been rejected from the post-grad physics course that I'd applied to do, which I thought was funny since I'd just been accepted to CERN. Um, I, I'd been just doing one post-grad course um, at a time just for fun, uh, and, and I'd applied at a, a quantum mechanics one, um, but I didn't get in. Because I didn't, I mean, I didn't have the prerequisites. I have a maths major. So my mom was always a good kind of a publicist for me whenever I did anything interesting, like uh, winning a writing competition or getting a, a iBook from Woz or something like that. She would make sure that the local papers knew about it and um, would they would come and interview me. So I got, I was in a couple of newspapers. This is one of the... Uh, articles and um, one of them one of the articles mentioned quite a bit that I was a big Mac fanatic and somebody uh, who lived not too far from us and apparently worked for Apple or at least for Renaissance which was running Apple's retail in New Zealand at the time uh, came by and actually brought me an Apple jacket uh, I have it over here, actually, um, it's uh, it's just black with a a black Apple logo on it, so it's a little bit subtle. But this was really useful because when I moved to Geneva, I had two big suitcases. I had my carry-on, and then I had these giant internal pockets in this jacket full of books because they don't weigh your jackets. Uh, and also, the first time I ever saw snow falling was in April that year in Geneva. Um, so it was nice to have a warm jacket. So thanks, whoever that was. I don't remember the person's name. Um, so, um, I, uh, what happened next? I've, well, I, I arranged everything. Um, 
to move to Geneva, basically. I found out from a, from a co-worker that if you go, if you went via the U.S. at that time, um, to, from, or via the U.S., you could take two 32 kilo suitcases. That is not the case anymore, but I took advantage of that and I had two probably 35 kilo suitcases because they were, used to be quite lenient about that. And I had my, my pockets full of books and my carry-on. I brought as much stuff as I could. Um, and on the 24th of March 2005, I arrived in Geneva. And um, I checked into the CERN hostel. Uh, they have a couple of hostels on site for people who are just visiting for a conference or for summer students or um, all sorts of things like that. Um, I ended up staying in the hostel for 42 nights or 41 nights, I think. Um, and my original booking ended and I actually a day earlier than I thought that it did. So I was, I was called, while I was in a meeting with my supervisor, they called me and said, hey, you've got to leave this room now. And I was, came down there and I, I think I was in tears. Uh, they, I needed to find somewhere else to stay, but they gave me a different room, which was the accessible room. And um, I, I liked that because um, I figured that if, if Stephen Hawking ever visited CERN, which he did, I actually ended up seeing him twice, uh, then he was probably staying in that room and I slept in Stephen Hawking's bed, which um, sounds creepy when I put it like that. Uh, anyway, um, I managed to, my, my original fellowship was for two years. Um, after that, I, I got a job in another group and another, after that, I, I think I had four different jobs there, always working in the, the compact muon solenoid experiment. Um, with, that's one of the big detectors, um, 100 meters underground. Uh, they actually built this one above ground and then lowered it down underground in slices. So uh, we, we had uh, Christmas parties in the shadow of the giant detector which is pretty neat. The, the other detectors were built mostly underground in place, um, but ours wasn't. And it's also the, the it's 12 and a half thousand tons. Uh, so it's the heaviest of the detectors, but it's smaller than the other general purpose detector, Atlas, which uh, weighs less, but it's a lot bigger. Um, they often mention that Atlas would float in water and CMS would sink. Um, hopefully that doesn't happen. So, um, my, my plan was to stay there at least until the, the, um, the LHC turned on. I did manage to do that. It turned on in 2008, uh, September 10th, I think. And, um, then I went to Paris for the Apple Expo and so I was in Paris eight days later when there was a cooling a coolant leak and basically everything blew up. I, well, not I shouldn't say that, but uh, there <laughs> there was um, some of the liquid helium uh, basically made a big boom and moved some of the giant 15 ton magnets around and they couldn't start the LHC up again for about a year and a half. Uh, but I just want to say I was in Paris when that happened. It was nothing to do with me. It was, um, it was like a faulty weld or something like that. Uh, don't take my word on that because I forgot to research that before talking and I might have forgotten. Um, but then I was still there at CERN when the LHC started the next time and when they announced the discovery of the Higgs, uh, I was no longer working in CMS but I was still at CERN and I was still officially in the CMS collaboration because you stay in it for a year or so after you stop working for them for the purposes of author lists on papers. Um, all of the papers published by the CMS collaboration have about two and a half thousand names on them, which means I'm pretty sure I have a, a defined Adush number, but I'm not quite sure what it is. Um, so 
Yeah, and then eventually, I my last job at CERN was with a company that was building a particle accelerator in Austria to treat cancer, um, which is, is kind of like radiotherapy, but better, basically. It delivers more uh, energy to the tumors and less to the healthy tissue, so it, it's... Um, basically kills the cancer and not you so much. Um, and, you know, a lot of other interesting things happened at CERN. Um, I think that's the main stuff about the story of how I got there. Uh, I should mention, actually, uh, you know how in the beginning I, I said that I was not eligible for the summer student program because I'd already graduated? Um, at one of my nights in the hostel, I met somebody from Canada who lived in New Zealand, um, who actually was a summer student um, through the, um, the Royal Society of New Zealand. They had a couple of summer student placements, and because it was not an official, they, they, they were not official summer students, um, they didn't have to comply with any of the rules of age limit or being an undergrad or anything, and actually not very many people applied for these, so they were really searching around for people to send to the CERN summer student program. Um, I forgot to mention, by the way, uh, the, the Marie Curie fellowship that I eventually got is open to anyone, uh, but the original, uh, the original CERN fellowship that I applied for, and really most positions at CERN, are open to nationals of CERN member states, uh, which New Zealand is not a CERN member state, but uh, my dad's British, so I actually immediately when I found out about the summer st school program, because that is also supposedly only open to CERN member states, except for through this Royal Society thing, um, I immediately emailed my dad asking for the documents I would need to get a British passport. Um, yeah, and, oh, another thing about nationality, uh, when I, um, so CERN has a card service that takes care of all of your, um, uh, like, immigration stuff, and uh, they'll make sure that you have a work permit and everything. You have to get a French card and a Swiss card, because CERN is in both countries, it's right on the border, um, and the Swiss card people apparently had never processed somebody from New Zealand before and um, they couldn't they weren't sure what the what the French word for a New Zealander was um, because New Zealand is called is a uh, Nova Zelande but a New Zealander is Neo Zelande and I, I think I told them uh, Neo Zelande because I had learnt that word by then um, and they wrote down Neerlande, which means Netherlands, which meant I had an official document saying that I was Dutch for a little while, but then I, I, I told them about that and, and I got it corrected. Um, yeah, I hope that this has been recording this whole time. I don't know, the light is on, but there's nothing on the screen saying it's making a video. Uh, that's why I'm doing this. I'm just learning how to use the camera, um, and I think I will stop there. If you have any questions about what it's like to work at CERN, or if you want to hear more about anything I've mentioned, let me know. Maybe I'll do another video like this, um, but uh, so far I think this is the last of the kind of big stories I could potentially ramble for this long about. Um, so... Yeah, uh, if there's something like that that you want to do, like a real long shot, like working at CERN or becoming an astronaut or whatever, just apply for it. If you have the time and the energy, I know it can be really hard to, to work up your um, self-confidence enough to write a, a letter and, and do all of the stuff. So, it, um, especially if you've been applying for a lot of jobs and being rejected a lot, it can be hard to, to get up enough hope to do it. But if you have the spoons um, and there is something way out there that you really want to do, 
just apply for it and and the the less possible it seems, the better, because then you will just expect to not get it, and when you don't get it, that'll be fine. But when you do get it, it will be amazing. Um, I mean, this has changed my life. I'm now living in Austria for some reason. Uh, and, yeah. So, go, go apply for the thing. That's my final word. Go apply for the thing.